Hey everyone, welcome to the Thursday edition of Tech Talks here. Um, Emmanuel was in town for a workshop that he was doing with, uh, for professional development for teachers Monday through Wednesday, so we couldn't get him in here during our normal Tuesday Tech Talks, hence this Thursday Tech Talk. But he's going to speak with us today um, not just about what Bootstrap does, which is this curriculum for teaching algebra using functional programming and video games, but also stepping back at a higher level and talking about CS education itself as an engineering problem. And this is his first time giving this talk, so go a little easy on him, but not too easy. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, hey, everybody. Um, I am told that the last speaker that you saw uh, brought beer samples, so I am already behind. Um, but thank you for uh, spending the time. Uh, so as Dave said, my name is Emmanuel Schanzer. I'm the founder and co-director of an organization called Bootstrap. And uh, we're uh, extremely active in the CS education space. And as Dave said, you know, originally I thought I was going to come here and give you one of like the polished like Bootstrap talks that I give all the time. But I really felt like I wanted to take a step back and talk more broadly about computer science as an engineering, computer science education as an engineering problem given the people that we have here in the room today. So that being said, just a sanity check, raise your hand if you identify as an engineer. Okay, a lot of engineers. And also, I'm curious, how many of you are interested in or active in some kind of computer science education? So maybe you're, you volunteer or you have your own intellectual curiosity? Cool, okay. So I wanna start this talk off with a simple question. So somebody walks into your office, right? They come to Pivotal and they say, you guys are consultants, you know, you know all about programming. Um, I want to teach computer science. So you're the expert. What language should I use? And I'm curious what you guys would, rec what you would recommend. What would you say to this person? Okay. JavaScript, okay. You, you know, you, Python, okay. Any other uh, thoughts or suggestions? Maybe Blockly, yep. Yeah. Great, fantastic. And I want to point out that all of your answers right now were tools, right? Specific languages, specific programs, specific tools. And this is exactly how it always goes. So here are some screenshots from an actual post on Facebook. Hey, everybody, I want some advice for ways to teach coding to a group of kids. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about CS, but like, I want your help. And someone says, you should teach Scratch. And someone else says, no, no, you should try Logo or maybe Lego Robotics. And someone else says, yeah, yeah, Logo, maybe C++ though. Um, and in general, everyone talks about the tool. So forget I said that. New question. Someone walks into your office and says, hey, you guys are pivotal. I could use some consulting. I want to make some software. You're the expert. What language should I use? <laughs> it, it depend, what does it depend on? Interesting. Interesting. Is that, is that what everyone else would ask, or would you guys dive in and say Python? So, so I, think, I think that's ex an extremely important observation, that you actually can't answer this person's question unless you ask about some of their intentions and their constraints, which I think is the kind of thing an engineer would respond with, right? You want me to build this? Great, what are my constraints? But I think it's interesting to note that when I asked you what language should be used for teaching computer science, there was none of that. And there never really is. Right? In general, people just jump in and they say, you should teach Logo. No, you should teach Scratch. No, it's all about JavaScript. Nobody approaches it like an engineer and says, well, if you want to teach computer science, what are your constraints? So let's take a minute and think about what are some constraints that we might ask that teacher if she comes to the office or he comes to the office and says, I want to teach coding. So what, what, what might we ask? Have you, ever programmed? Have you ever programmed before? Excellent, right. Maybe the teacher has never, basically PowerPoint is it. Yeah, what else? How, how old are the kids? Anything? What kind, of technology is what kind of technology is even available? Yeah, are we, are, is everybody on iPads? Or are we talking like some you know, fancy, fancy pants machine with keyboards and multiple windows? Anything else? Excellent question. Yeah, can they do work from home? Fabulous question. And you had one of yeah, what, what, what do you mean when you say computer science? Do we want to be doing data, like teaching databases? Do we want to be teaching web design? Or, you know, yeah, excellent. 
So I have a, a, couple of, a couple of constraints that I listed here. And by the way, you guys came up with some very, very good ones. Um, so questions that I would ask that teacher if they came to me. I would say, what age are the students? Excellent. Have the students programmed before? Right? I mean, are they, are they like masters of monads already? Or are they merely like PowerPoint pokey, you know, poking? Um, is it a required class? Or are we dealing with a self-selected group of kids? How long is the class? Is it uh, 30 minutes once a week? Is it an hour every single day for a year? Does it run for a semester? Is it even a class? I didn't specify that this teacher wanted to teach it in a classroom. Maybe they want to do a drop-in coding club at the local museum. How many kids are there? Is this a small group or is it a giant lecture hall? So these are some, some of the sort of first level constraints. And I have another slide with some constraints that people really don't often consider. And some of you named them, which is great. Um, is there internet access? Has the teacher programmed before? Can the students type? That's a really important basic question. Can they even type? Do you have students with, let's say, visual or sensory motor uh, d disabilities, right? What are the other constraints that we're talking about? Do they have computer access at home? Do they even have computer access in the school? What kind of resources are we talking about? Is it going to be a computer science class that meets in a lab every single day? Or is it really a computer science class that gets access to a laptop cart on Friday afternoons? That will change what you teach. So, I, I, I started off with this because I wanted to emphasize how important it is to look at computer science education as an engineering problem. And if we start with the constraints, then maybe we can get somewhere. But so often, when tech people are asked for their advice on the subject, they forget that they're engineers and they just say, try this tool. I liked it. So let's keep going. Let's start. We've got our constraints. The next step, if we want to think about this, is to define our metrics. How are we going to measure whether what we build is successful or not? And I would posit that there are basically three metrics that we need to be looking at. First, equity has to be built in from jump. Right? Otherwise, you wind up with a situation where you have computer science classes in every school in America, and the only kids who sign up are rich white boys. And I think that that would be considered a failure. So we definitely need some equity here. We also need massive scale. Right? It's great if we can pull something off at a high school, and it's equitable, and it's wonderful. But if it costs too much, or if it relies on some charismatic individual to make it go, and it can't scale everywhere, again, I would say we haven't succeeded. And there are some programs that get both of these, equity and scale. For example, some of you may be familiar with code.org and their Hour of Code. Hour of Code reaches millions of kids every year, massive scale, and tremendous equity. But even Hadi Partovi himself would say that Hour of Code is not rigorous computer science education. It's merely exposure. So I think that we need to make sure we're hitting all three of these to, when we talk about whether or not we want, uh, we're successful. So next step, what's the solution space? What are our options, given these constraints and these metrics? Well, one option is mandatory computer science. Uh, Tim Cook apparently recently just asked our president to have a mandatory computer science requirement for kids in America. What, or maybe an elective. Maybe it's opt-in courses. Um, maybe we go through after-school or out-of-school programs. So this could be in the afternoon. It could be like a Saturday coding club. It could be a, a summer program. Or maybe we could try integrating computing into existing courses. So for the rest of this talk, or the first half of the talk, I want to go through each of these options and sort of take a look at what we know about how they stack up. So required courses. Every kid in America will learn computer science because we're going to have a mandatory CS class in every high school. So to do that, we need to hire a lot of computer science teachers and fill a lot of computer science classes. And that's really the first problem. Required courses don't scale. You want to have a lot of computer science teachers in California? Great. I sure hope there is a, such a thing as a computer science teacher certification, because if there isn't, we have to address that first. And it turns out that in most states in the country, there is no such thing as a CS teacher certification. So we've got to fix this first. That's a lot of years and a lot of dollars. Once that's done, we should aim to recruit about 20,000 full-time dedicated computer science teachers nationwide, assuming we want to reach every ninth grader. That'll take more years and more dollars. Now let's assume we do that. All 20,000 of them are now highly skilled, wonderful computer science teachers. And of course, not one of them is lured away by Silicon Valley to go make more money doing that. Right? Let's say they all decide they're going to stay in the classroom. Well, we still have to pay their salaries, which means about a billion dollars a year added to the national education budget in perpetuity. I find that somewhat unlikely. 
And even if we solve all three of these, there's still like the laws of time and space. There's a finite number of hours in the day and a finite number of rooms in the school building, so where will these classes fit? I suppose we could cut, you know, theater and art, right? I'm just kidding, we cut those already. Um, so basically, when we look at our metrics, you lose scale right off the bat. And there's something else that's in jeopardy here, because the moment it's a required class, which means if a kid doesn't pass it, they don't graduate, there's enormous pressure on that teacher to make trade-offs when it comes to rigor. So I'm not saying that we automatically lose rigor, but the incentive structure is perverse, right? Suddenly, maybe we should just make it as thin and light as possible to make sure every kid graduates. So, option number two. Let's do the same thing, but not make it mandatory for every kid. Let's have an elective class, right? Well, the problem with electives is that elective courses aren't equitable. In the United States, we have graduation requirements, and they vary from state to state, but in general, there's some number of math classes a student must complete. There's some number of science classes a student must complete. And then there's like a miscellaneous literacy group. So in some states, that's like English or English language arts or history or civics, but there's these required courses. And you have this, this lovely grid structure. This is a hypothetical structure for what a high school pathway might look like. And it looks great, and there's room for computer science and some art, which is great. What happens the moment a student fails one of the required classes? What happens? They got to take it again. That's right. So suppose kid fails freshman algebra. Now they got to take it again. So this whole pathway has been affected. But there's a ripple effect. Because now, since they're in remedial math, they also have to take an extra math class to like, help them double up. And since now they're not going to get that fourth math credit, they need another math class somewhere else in the schedule. And it's like financial math or applied math or something to give them that credit. And there's a second ripple effect, which is that most science classes have Algebra 1 as a prerequisite. So if a kid isn't even familiar with basic functions, guess what? They can't take freshman physics. So there's this huge ripple effect where this, you started with this lovely grid structure and everything went to hell. And what happens if a kid fails a second required class? Right? Now, all of a sudden, the opportunity for electives disappears. And so the only kids who are able to take electives are the kids who are already doing well and uh, high performing. So for kids who are failing or struggling, there's no room for anything else. And which kids are those? Is it a random distribution? No, it's not. And so all of a sudden, we're exacerbating the achievement gap. Because instead of just graduating with one less math class, now they're also graduating with one less CS class. Because it's only the kids who were already doing well who had the opportunity to take that class. And now they're just one step higher. So we lose out on equity. But there's something else that's at risk here. Because if you're the principal of a high school, and you know that you want to have maybe one or two periods of computer science electives, does it make sense for you to hire a full-time teacher just to teach one or two classes? Of course not. So what do schools do in this situation? Say again? They get volunteers to, to teach a full-time class? Honestly, that's pretty rare. If only because volunteers tend to get busy, sometimes they can't make it to school, or they, they you know, have to pass a background check. Who will they hire? Or rather, what will they do to staff that class? Yeah, grab the history teacher, you teach the class. Grab the math teacher, here you go, teach them some Python or whatever. Which means now you have teachers who are teaching this class who are not content experts, which means we're starting to lose rigor as well. Option three, let's start an after school program. It'll be great, kids will meet on Tuesday and, Tuesdays and Thursdays from 3.30 to six, it'll be awesome. Or maybe like Saturday mornings, or maybe during the summer we'll do something, it'll be perfect. Um, this is actually how Bootstrap got started. So rewinding seven years or so, at one point we were one of the largest after-school providers of formal computer science. We partnered with a national after-school program. We worked with hundreds of volunteer engineers from Google, Facebook, Cisco, Apple, NVIDIA, you name it. We had tons of engineers going into schools. And when we looked at the impact we were having, we shut it down. We just completely stopped. So why? Right? Why did we do that? So this is a battle scar. This is a hard-fought lesson that I'm passing on to you because this was like almost the end of Bootstrap when we gave this up. The problem is, after-school computer science has to compete with after-school everything else. After-school theater, after-school sports, 
after school having a job, after school going home to take care of your little brother and sister, which means the only kids who self-select into those programs are the kids with the means and the opportunity to do so. So we've just lost equity. On top of that, especially if you're an after-school program that's literally after school, like not just on Saturday, but in the afternoon, the school day is long. And for a 13 or 14-year-old kid who got up in the morning, maybe made their little brother or sister breakfast, went to school, was in school for seven or eight hours, and now is coming to you at the end of the day, often they're not ready for the kind of rigorous computer science that we might want them to be learning, which might explain why so many after-school programs really are, they start with tinker and play pedagogy, right? Let's just, here, here's Scratch, here's JavaScript, tinker, see what happens. Oh, cool, it worked, great, yay. But then that's also where they stop. It's just more and more tinker and play. Add to that the fact that a lot of after-school programs have much less rigorous standards for things like attendance and retention. So kids are basically dropping in when they feel like it, which again, hurts your ability to teach rigorous computer science. But it does scale really well, I will say that. So what's the last option? The last option is that we try to integrate computing into existing co courses. And I want to give you an in equation. The phrase, everybody should learn CS, which I think many of us in the room agree with this statement, absolutely does not mean that everyone should take CS classes. So what if we integrate? What courses make sense for us to try to stick computer science into? I'm going to take a, a strong statement and say we should be focusing on algebra, and I'll tell you why. So first, algebra is the gateway course to the all STEM fields. So we all sort of understand, like, if a kid fails algebra and then just gives up, they're screwed for the mm part of STEM, right? They're probably not going to be a professional mathematician. But we often forget that without algebraic functions, you ain't modeling projectile motion in physics. You're not balancing chemical equations. You're not talking about population growth and rates of change in biology. And if you want to go into economics or finance or business, guess what? Without functions, you can't even do compound interest. So if a student fails algebra one and checks out, we've just shut them off from the entire STEM pipeline. So this is a good course, an important course, to try to contribute to. Secondly, a wise man once said, it's all about the Benjamins. And a 2004 study looked at the correlation between high school class performance and lifetime earnings. And they found that of all the grades a child gets in high school in the United States, the grade they get in Algebra 1 is more strongly correlated than any other class with the amount of money that child will make for the rest of his or her life. And when you look at which students fail Algebra 1 disproportionately more than others, you realize all of a sudden we're just recreating poverty cycles, we're recreating achievement gaps. So this is a legitimate problem. So it's not just about learning and STEM and the job career. It's also a serious issue of equity in this country. There's a reason Bob Moses calls Algebra a civil right. And on top of that, Algebra 1 is a high school graduation requirement nationwide. Every kid has to take it. So this is a really nice target to think about maybe putting computer science into it. And hey, while we're at it, let's talk about how it stands up to our metrics. Integration is scalable, equitable, and rigorous. It's scalable because every kid takes algebra, so you're reaching tens of millions of children. It's scalable because you can leverage existing teachers, existing courses, and existing professional organizations to get this thing off the ground. And it's equitable because, again, every child takes algebra. So instead of having the self-selected group that reinforces within itself and outside of itself who the computer science kids are, we just put an X through that right away. All of us did it. All of us took computer science. And the content is well suited to rigorous instruction and evaluation. So there's, there's, there's a foundation up upon which we can build. Now, this basically proves that there is such a thing as a free lunch, right? You, do you believe me? We've solved it, guys. Free lunch. It's easy. Computer science and algebra, problem solved. Not quite, because we've essentially traded one set of intractable constraints for a different set of intractable constraints. Instead of trying to squeeze computer science into the context of a resource-starved school, if we want to enter Algebra 1, now we have to actually figure out which computing content makes sense for teaching algebra. Because if we take away time from a math teacher's class, if we ask them to do something, and at the end of the day, it turns out that their math scores don't move, or God forbid, go down, we're toast. So what we want 
is transfer. This is a term from cognitive science. So transfer is simply defined as a skill learned in one context is used successfully in another. So if students are learning X when they're programming, they'll be able to apply X when they're doing standard pencil and paper math. That's what we want. That's what we need if we're going to pull this off. The problem is that transfer is really, really hard to direct. There's some requirements. So first, turns out the research says if you want transfer, you need explicit instruction. It is not enough to give a kid a, a task, have them finish it, and then give them a similar task in a related field. There's no guarantee that they're going to see the connection between the two, and often they don't. So having someone in the room point out the similarities between tasks, having it be made explicit, dramatically increases your likelihood of transfer. So that one we've got because we're working with math teachers. They can be the ones doing the instruction. It also requires deep structural similarities between the tasks. How deep? Insanely deep. So there's a 2009 case study that you may find depressing. Um, so there was an analysis done of a physics teacher's classroom, and this teacher spent a week talking about gravity and acceleration. And he had his students do tons and tons of problems in which objects were dropped from great heights. So what if you drop a penny off the Empire State Building? What if you drop a basketball off the Eiffel Tower? And he had his students do things like, well, how many, after how many seconds will it have fallen to this, this height? Uh, what's the velocity after a certain number of seconds? What how many seconds does it take to get a certain velocity? Tons and tons of problems. Gave his class a quiz. And the quiz had a number of problems on it where objects were dropped down deep holes, such as the Grand Canyon or down a deep well. And a lot of the students complained that the test was unfair. Why? You didn't give us any hole problems. You only gave us tower problems. Getting transfer to work reliably is insanely hard. The tasks need to be so much more aligned than you could possibly imagine. And on top of that, the third thing is, even if you get these first two right, you need to be explicitly teaching a process, essentially the metacognitive quality to it, right? So we solved this puzzle, now we solve this other puzzle. There's no guarantee kids connect them unless a teacher points out, here is the process we used for solving that first problem. Do we see that same process in the second problem? So these are our requirements. So explicit instruction, check, we've got that one. Let's talk about deep structural similarities because this is only going to work if the programming we're doing is deeply similar to the math kids are doing. And I have awful news for you. Most coding languages in, that we teach in K-12 don't have functions. And I think a lot of you folks here know what I'm talking about. Um, so often in programming languages, functions fail the vertical line test left and right. There's some global state, and every time you call a function with an input, you mutate the state, and the state changes the output, which means I can call a function with the same input 10 times and potentially get 10 different answers. Obviously not a function. Even worse, often, like in a language called Blockly, functions don't really have any computed output at all. So there's no similarity here. And so a teacher who's using the function machine metaphor, inputs come in, something gets computed, and that's output, falls down here. Coding also doesn't have variables. Again, this is something I think you guys are all familiar with. So he, Here's a simple two-line function. I could write this in Java. I could write this in C. I could write this in Scratch. Uh, when I run this program, uh, let's pretend you guys are my ninth graders. All right, kids, what's the final value of x? 12, gold star for all of you. You got it right. Except as a math teacher, I want to shoot myself in the face because this is mathematically impossible. And you know what they call x, by the way, in Scratch and in Java and in C? They call it a variable. Isn't that weird? It's obviously not, and yet that's what we call it. Ditto for functions, by the way. Now, there's actually two problems here. So I'm curious, what, so what's, what's the problem with this? Yeah, that we're overloading the equal sign to mean assignment. So that's the first problem, which is, which is syntactic. And we could fix that, right? We could you know, maybe put a colon here or an arrow here or do something, right? But there's a much deeper problem, which is that beyond the syntax, Semantically, assignment doesn't exist in math at all anyway, right? And assignment statements, especially those of you who come from a functional programming pedigree, assignment statements, you know, can often be somewhat difficult for novice programmers. Even expert programmers sometimes get caught up because of state mutation. 
So now we've got this concept that's notoriously difficult for novice programmers in a programming class, and we're going to make math teachers talk about it. And since it's not in the math book, even if they do a good job, there's still the opportunity cost because the hours they spent getting it right are hours they could have been teaching math. Coding also doesn't have numbers, and you kind of need numbers to do math. For example, as we all know, 1 divided by 2 is? It's 0, yeah. 0.5. Right. Why is it 0? It's obviously an integer, right? And so, of course, if a teacher is using a language like this, they now have to talk about the difference between ints, floats, longs, and doubles, and each one has trade-offs because they don't actually properly model a continuous infinite number line. They make these different trade-offs, and now the teacher has to explain to the student how you have to declare which type you want and when one type is appropriate. None of this has anything to do with math at all. Uh, suppose, so these two expressions, thinking like a math teacher, would you guys agree that these two expressions should produce the same result? These are equivalent structural expressions. What happens if A plus B is uh, an overflow error? Maybe we should have subtracted C first, and then we would have like, bought ourselves enough room. So this first one will error out, this one will work. They do not produce the same result. And vice versa with an underflow error at the bottom. Uh, similarly, uh, these two expressions, as a math teacher, if, my, if a student, student A hands me this, student B hands me that, those are equivalent expressions, right? Because of what property? If anyone, the distributive property, yes, the math teacher in me is happy. Except if these are floats, you've got problems because the, you may have error compound differently depending on whether you've distributed it or not. So we break associativity, we break distributivity. These are like not even, this is like middle school math concepts that we're now breaking. So when you think back to the tower problem versus the whole problem, if kids couldn't make that connection, this is suicide. And this is how virtually all K-12 programming works, by the way. Almost nobody does functional programming. Um, we do, for what it's worth. Um, but to be clear, this, is, this should not be construed as functional programming is the answer. Functional programming is merely part of an answer here. Because you need more than just picking a language that's appropriate for your task. You also need a process for performing those tasks. So don't be deceived into thinking that like, OCaml is the win here. Um, so I'm gonna give you guys an extremely scientific graph. I know that you guys are engineers and you're driven by data, so please pay close attention to this graph. So the y-axis is frustration level. And the x-axis is the number of lines of code that a student writes while solving a problem. And it sort of looks like this in an intro class. Uh, the student starts out with no lines of code, and they're staring at the blank screen, and they're just like, oh, I don't know where to start. And then eventually they get going. Uh, this is called the blank page syndrome. They're writing code, they're starting to, starting to get where they need to go. And then they find a corner case they forgot, or they hit a bug, and uh, the frustration grows. And students are sort of like 3D printers, right? They, they, they work by additive manufacturing. So every time something doesn't work, the answer is always, let's add more code. And so the lines of code grow and grow and grow until eventually the complexity has gone through the roof, a student can't find the solution, and they just throw their hands up in the air and say, my program doesn't work, I give up. You may have seen this with some students, or even some adults. This is fairly common. So. How do we address this? What is the explicit process that we use to address this? Well, it's funny because no discipline works this way where like the first thing you do is start jumping straight into your solution space, right? So um, architects, they don't start by pouring concrete and then adding stuff to it until they get a building. Like nobody does that, right? So instead of starting with the building, maybe they'll do like blueprints or models. Um, Maybe you're like a hardware engineer. You don't start by like ordering your prototype mouse and then like changing it and seeing what works. You probably do some sort of diagrams or schematics. All of these disciplines have an approach that involves multiple stages where each stage builds on the last. There's some notion of process development. And those stages are also multi-representational. So you have different notational systems, whether it's a model or a circuit diagram or a blueprint. And these notational systems, each one exposes a different viewpoint on the nature of the problem. Whereas when kids think about computer science, they just assume it's all code. We jump straight to the code. Now, 
in high schools and middle schools, there's another class, another teacher that cares a lot about multi-stage, multi-representational problems. And that's the algebra teacher. Because in algebra, we teach explicitly that a function can be viewed as having multiple representations, that each representation gives you different viewpoints on that function and its behavior. And often a math teacher will teach a word problem, for example, in multiple stages. Sally sells lemonade for a dollar a glass, you know, describe her profit as a function of glasses sold. A math teacher might start with a couple of concrete. What, ha what happens if uh, Sally sells one glass, two glasses, three glasses? And then ask students to generalize into something more formal, right? What's the rule? What's the pattern? So this dovetails perfectly with the way math teachers think. So how do we use this to teach programming? So this is an actual page from our student workbook, which is pencil and paper, by the way, for those of you who are wondering about hardware access. And we ask students to start out thinking through a problem on paper before they go to the computer to type it in. Because often, the thinking part is where bugs actually happen, not the coding part. So here's a simple word problem that's uh, based on this video game we have them write. Uh, write a function update target, which takes the target's x coordinate and produces the next x, which is 50 pixels to the right. And so we ask the student to come up with a contract and purpose statement. Um, so the contract describes the name, domain, and range of the function. And if it's a middle school class, maybe it maps from numbers to numbers. If it's a high school class, maybe you want them to use proper set notation or specify uh, you know, whether it's naturals or reals. And then the student has to describe, has to translate that problem into their own words. They have to comment their code. We have them write concrete examples. Update target when given 10 should produce the same as adding 50 to 10. Same thing with 20. We ask students to identify the parts that change for math teachers, this is what's the rule, what's the pattern. And then from there, we have them generalized to a formal function definition. Now, computer scientists have names for these stages, right? This is essentially a type specification or interface. These are essentially a form of test cases. And then this is the code, the finished product. Math teachers also have names for these things. They call the first step the domain and range, the second one input-output tables, and the third is the symbolic form of the equation. They mean the same thing, as so assuming your language performs mathematically. So we have multiple representations of the act of coding and multiple representations of functions. And over the last 10 years, we've used this quite effectively to manage student frustration. When students are, st are starting and they don't know what to do, of course they do. The first step is always think about the contract for the function. Do we at least know its name, what its input and output types are? And as they go through solving the problem, there's a scaffold that supports them at each step. Once you finish this stage, you know what the next stage is. That stage has explicit connections to the one before, so you can build on what you know. So that's our approach. And when you're building a curriculum or a course of some kind and you want to have something like this, we essentially have a dependency graph. So you've got to pick your language, you've got to develop a curriculum, and you have to use a pedagogy. Do you guys know what I mean when I say pedagogy? So pedagogy is all the things that make a teacher a good teacher that are not already in the book, right? It's the skill of being a teacher. And pedagogical techniques include certain example, you know, how to fi find the right examples, certain ways to ask questions, how to probe deeper. And there is a pedagogy for teaching algebra that is not the same as the pedagogy for teaching history. So it's a level of content knowledge and mastery that a good teacher needs and develops over time. And you need all three. So, these have dependency graphs, I'm sorry, uh, are strongly connected in the graph. Each one you choose changes and impacts what you can do for the others. So for our purposes, if we want to get into algebra, well, our language, for one thing, it should be a functional programming language. Secondly, we want it, unit testing to be relatively easy. Functional gives us that because we think testing matters and we know math teachers have kids create con concrete steps before they generalize anyway. So our, we had to have that for our language. While we're at it, images are fun. Let's have first class images so functions can compute and produce images as opposed to writing to an off-screen buffer somehow. And it needs to have mathematical semantics. The pedagogy needs to support structured problem solving, multiple representations, and worked examples. And the examples here are where we get our tests. And then finally, you need to build a curriculum. You cannot simply say, here teachers, here's a list of fun activities. You need to actually give them complete sets of materials. That means lesson plans, standards alignment, homework activities, quizzes, rubrics, warm-up activities, exit slips, 
everything a teacher needs. Because if you don't develop those, you're making an assumption that the teacher has time to do so. And teachers are very busy. Um, and we have a narrative final project in our algebra course, which is students essentially, they learn foundational concepts and each one they apply directly to a video game of their own design. And it's cool, kids show off their games. Uh, and what's nice is we actually get code reviews out of this. So this is a photo of an actual uh, exhibition. This student was dragged up to the board, uh, Facebook hosted, uh, this is a student from East Palo Alto, so Facebook hosted a, a video game launch party. Uh, and the kids had to defend their decisions in front of parents, friends, and a few engineers who came to visit. And because we hit math, right, because we're in the math classes where every kid is, we reach more than 20,000 students every single year, which makes us one of the largest providers of in-school computer science in the US. And since we're reaching the classes where you have all the kids, we have the most, I would say, second or first most diverse program in the country. 43% of our students are girls and young women, 46% are students of color. This also makes us, by the way, the largest provider of in-school computer science for young women and for students of color nationwide. And we didn't do that because we made a program targeted at one group. We solved this generally by going where the kids already are. Everyone takes algebra. So that's what we're all about. We care deeply about equity, scale, and rigor. I should add that algebra is not the only source of point of entry. We have curriculum uh, in physics that we're developing with the American Association of Physics Teachers. They're going to endorse this next year that will allow a, a school to integrate computing not just into their algebra class, but into their physics class, as well as a nascent data science curriculum that we're developing that has a number of possible points of entry. Our vision is that a school should be able to integrate computing, rigorous computing, into multiple mandatory courses across the, the, the spectrum without having to find room in the budget for a new teacher or room in the schedule for a new class. If you're interested in getting involved, if I have excited you in some way, we have obviously your typical sort of financial needs, but we have engineering needs. If you feel like hacking for a cause, there's lots of stuff that we're doing. I would love to give a more technical talk at some point um, and geek out with you about our compiler, our programming language, some of the work that we're doing around accessibility for students who are, have visual impairments. Uh, there's some really cool stuff. Or you can simply advocate. If you know of a school or a district that you wish was teaching computer science, tell them that there's a way to do it using the teachers they already have that's been proven to have positive impact on student algebra scores. Whoops, don't die. It's my last slide. Ah. <laughs> well, the last slide which I would put up is this. Same as the title, emphasis on the is, which is to say that this stuff really is an engineering problem. And if we go back to the beginning where I asked the question, what should I teach? You guys are engineers. You understand that value of stable, tested, rigorous infrastructure, which isn't necessarily as sexy as the things on the cover of Wired magazine, right? Education is the same way. We don't need flashy, sexy virtual reality. We need somebody to step up and build the educational infrastructure that can deploy and scale to millions of users. For some reason, Silicon Valley and the tech industry, we're great at viewing everything as an engineering problem, right? Everything from ordering a taxi to ordering your groceries. But when it comes to education, we like have amnesia and we stop thinking like engineers. Bootstrap is a team of four people. And by attacking this like engineers, we've become one of the largest providers of computer science in the country. Imagine what we could do if real engineering companies got involved and put their strengths to use. To do that, you've got to change the way you think about CS education. And I hope that I've helped do that a tiny, tiny bit today. So thank you guys so much. So yeah, I've got some time. Yeah. Yeah, so what are our results in terms of student outcomes? I'm so glad that you asked because I have a, a slide just for that. So um, our first set of learning goals were the, our most important ones, which is at the end of the day, do bootstrap students actually do better on standard pencil and paper math problems? Because that's how we're gonna be judged. So we do pre and post tests with our students. The questions on these tests are selected from state standard exams. Not to say that we love standardized tests, but we understand that that's how decisions are often made. And we found strong, statistically significant results across eighth and ninth graders. So there's, uh, even when you change ages, these results are, are uh, um, robust. And uh, we're finding these for things like function composition, word problems, 
and matching representations of functions. So we know that an algebra curriculum has many, many, many more tasks than that. These are the three that we've studied, but we found strong evidence of success with those three. Yeah? What's going on with the, is that Florida control group? Bottom line? Yeah, so this is a, a classroom in Florida that did not use Bootstrap. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is at the end of the year, the students perhaps felt a little burned out and maybe didn't take the post-test as seriously, or it's possible that they maybe started to get a little bit confused, some of the things that they had learned maybe resulted in some mental uh, cognitive overload. It's unclear. Um, something we have noticed, though, is that there does seem to be a trend where students' scores in math tend to dip slightly um, over the, in that last quarter. Could be summer slump. Right, so the question is, how do we avoid being like a program for elite schools? And the answer is, when we say we help students with algebra, the elite schools don't care. Their students are already doing well with algebra. And so the, like, the, play, the schools in the districts that have pursued us the most, that make up 90% of our population are DC public schools, Chicago public schools, New York City public schools. Um, so in general, when you sell yourself as we can help kids in math, you get the opposite of the elite schools who buy in. And I would also add, something you just said was that, you know, it might be only the elite schools that can afford a program like this. I beg to differ. This is by far orders of magnitude cheaper than hiring a dedicated computer science teacher, right? By leveraging their existing investment in the math teachers they already have, this cuts the cost to a fraction of what it might otherwise be. So it's marginal cost instead of massive cost. Uh, so in, in general, we're serving the population that we, we've set out to serve. Yeah? Well, two things. One is we'd like to scale horizontally, meaning take the, the products we have and scale much, much faster. Um, we're only four people. There's only so many people we can train in a year that way. We would love to continue to build a pipeline of trainers who could deliver this thing on a massive scale nationwide. The second thing we'd spend on is scaling vertically, meaning we think that there are other places that we can apply our knowledge of computer science and transfer beyond just algebra and physics. So data science is on its way, but we would certainly like to go deeper. There's also natural applications for calculus, for the way our program does, handles animation. Essentially, kids are writing delta functions between each frame. So we think that there's a lot of other curricula that we could build if we had the resources to do so. Great question. So how do we support teachers once they come to our training? Um, right now we have an online discussion group that's fairly active and teachers from all over the world post questions there. The discussions are fantastic. So teachers really dig into this issue of transfer and because we have a mix of computer science and math teachers on the forum, you'll typically get different viewpoints. So that's the go-to. We also offer for certain school districts that would like us to do this. Um, we can do everything ranging from online office hours. So you, maybe you set up a video conference We'll say for one hour every Friday at 6 p.m., one of the Bootstrap team will be just on a Google Hangout, and teachers can log on and ask questions if they want. Um, and then at the extreme end of the spectrum, we will even fly back to the district and do site visits. So we've set that up with a number of districts. Um, one final note I'll add, actually, that's interesting that we've observed is that when you set up the office hours, teachers don't often show up. But what's remarkable is that it makes a noticeable difference in their likelihood of teaching the course. Simply knowing that there would be someone they could ask if they ran into trouble gives them the confidence to give it a shot. Yeah? What are the opportunities to get this curriculum adopted by states? So, in the US, education is insanely decentralized. So the federal government couldn't mandate a curriculum or anything like that. Um, at the state level, there are some opportunities in some states. So some states will have sort of a menu of endorsed curriculum that they might say, you know, any school, if, if you use one of our endorsed curricula, you're eligible for state funds to support it. So that's, some, that's, that's one avenue that we could take. Um, and then certainly at the district and school level, there's a lot more opportunity. So what would be fantastic is suppose, you know, someone at LAUSD 
were interested in talking to us about this sort of thing. This is where typically uh, a company would have like a sales or marketing person to go and make that connection. Um, we have been talking to a couple of folks in the department, uh, although they're not necessarily high up enough in the pyramid, um, but we're working to build those relationships. We've made it in Chicago, so Chicago, that's, 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 that's a district we're thrilled to be working with, and we've, we have the ear of the right people, but we haven't made it to the right people yet here in LA. Sure. Sure. So our development platform is homegrown. It's entirely cloud-based because Chromebooks are incredibly popular, iPads are incredibly popular. Um, it's very lightweight, so it does not require the latest and greatest hardware to run. Um, as far as how we have curricular materials and pedagogical techniques that, that support low technology environments, there's a couple of things. Pedagogically, we are extremely, extremely, like we're high supporters of pair programming. So that's something that we build in at every level. Um, and if students are pair programming, you only need one computer for every two students, which cuts down on the tech needs. And there's also an awful lot of learning that comes out of that as well. I know, I, I heard a rumor you guys are into pair programming too sometimes, so, so you know what I'm talking about there. Um, as far as the, the scaffolded paper and pencil materials, like what are those good for? So it's remarkable. Uh, computer programs, or I'm sorry, programming languages are pretty unforgiving. Like if you forget a parenthesis or a curly brace or a semicolon, sometimes depending on the language, the program won't run at all or it'll run but incorrectly. Um, and so for students, especially students who are afraid of making a mistake, starting out with their hands on the keys can be pretty terrifying. Um, and you might imagine that given that there's a terror here, that terror is disproportionately rooted in different students. The kids who already think they're programmers aren't as afraid. The kids who, you know, look around and they say, I don't know if I'm, I, I don't know if I look like a computer science person, those kids are the ones who are the most harmed by that sort of hands on the key terror. So giving them paper and saying, let's start by writing out what we're thinking. If you forget a semicolon, who cares? It's paper. Um, sort of frees up students' ability to think. Um, the paper and pencil scaffolds that we use, I showed you one of them. This is the multi-stage process for solving word problems. We also have scaffolds for translating between representations. Um, we have scaffolds with all these visual spatial metaphors for things like order of operations and function composition. All of these are done far more effectively on paper than on a computer in the first place. And then of course, if you don't have computers in your classroom today, kids can still take out their books and keep working and keep learning. Um, if the kids don't have computers when they go home at night, the books and the paper and pencil scaffolds are useful things. Um, and then finally, and this is, a, I know, a longer answer than, than maybe you were intending, but finally, I think it's important for us as computer scientists to break the harmful and totally wrong belief that kids have that computer scientists do everything on the computer. Like, in, within iShot, I see a giant whiteboard right there. Computer scientists spend an enormous amount of time not on a computer when working through problems. And I think if you ask your average high school kid, what does a computer scientist do all day? They'll say they type. So not only is it not good for learning, not good for underrepresented kids, it's also just false to, to not use any kind of written paper and pencil or whiteboard scaffold. I know someone else had a hand up before. Or, oh, yeah. oh. oh, we're out of time. Sounds good. All right, well, I'll hang out here for a little while. Guys, thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, have a good rest of the day.